Friendships and one's happiness. How closely are those two related? Without good friends, can one really have a happy life? One seminal study showed that four out of five men have no close friends except their spouse. How do they get by? Well, welcome to Insights. I'm Dick Goldberg, and today we'll explore what is a good friendship? How do you cultivate good friends? How important really is it to your happiness? How do you build a friendship network? With us to discuss this, our guest, Patricia Clayson. She's an author, lecturer, and for the past 30 years has been director of the Center for Creative Learning in Milwaukee, where over 5,000 people have been through her workshops in personal growth and development. Patricia, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. It's good to be here. <laughs> Patricia, what do you, your belief is about how important friendship is in your life, in, in terms of your happiness? Well, personally, friendships are absolutely critical to my life and my happiness, and I believe that that's true for all human beings. I, I go back to the work of Dr. Virginia Satir and others who have done research on people connections, and Dr. Satir quotes a study about touch connections, and she says we need four touch connections a day to survive, eight touch connections a day to maintain, and 12 touch connections a day to thrive. And a touch connection is considered a handshake or a hug or some other interpersonal human connection. And they were looking specifically at touch. However, I think we can reasonably translate that information into the idea of friendships in that we need to have interconnectedness. Human beings are not designed to function in isolation. Solitary confinement is the worst possible punishment for any human being where they have no contact with other human beings at all. Um, so we need that, that connection and whether it's a touch connection or a verbal connection on the phone or, or some kind of internet interconnectedness, we need to have that in order to just simply maintain in our lives uh, and to thrive, we need to have a lot of that connection. Well, you know, you could you could be a telemarketer and have a hundred connections a day and have no friends. But that's not the same as the kind of connection we're talking about here. It's not just about um, hi to another human being and you know give me your order kind of thing or I'm selling you something. It's about a sense of what one might call intimacy. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm using that word in a little bit different way than uh, most people when they think of the word intimacy. For a lot, it would have a sexual connotation to it. Um, but what I'm talking about, I like to use a play on words, in, to, me, see. Hmm. That's pretty cute. <laughs> intimacy. Uh -huh. So. Intimacy is when I share something about me, something personal, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. about my emotions, what I care about, what I thought about, um, and I share that with you. I'm letting you see into who I am. That's good. And when you share that with me, then we start to have that thing called intimacy. We have a connection or a bond. And so when I'm talking about these connections that, that human beings need, um, just being a politician and walking around shaking hands wouldn't suffice for the touch connection mm -hmm. concept either. You know, it's that that true interaction and exchange of of energy and 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 caring and knowledge of the other. You beat me to something. I was going to ask if intimacy is part of every friendship, but um, I have a hunch you'll have a different spin if you're asked that directly. You have to have intimacy to be a friend. I'm going to say yes. You are. The kind of intimacy I just talked about, yes. Okay, but what if you have a fishing buddy and two guys go fishing and they sit there in parallel fishing um, mode for four hours and a couple grunts and a couple conversations about the weather and the fish and they go home? But Is that a that's friendship? About, yeah, it's a friendship because that's about how they communicate. Really? That's, um, how I see that is it's a, okay, we have something in common. We both enjoy doing this. We want someone to do it with us. We want company. And in that, I'm sharing a part of me. I'm sharing something mm. that I care about. 
Um, you know, and that's the thing with, you know, the, you quoted that thing about the study about men at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that um, men may not talk about having close friends because they look at what women think about as friends and how their wives and other women in their life may have friends. But for guys, for many, not all, um, you know, just hanging out and watching the game or fishing, like you said, or going hunting, and they're, you know, they're in separate cabins, and then they, or not separate cabins, but separate um, mm-hmm. hunting stands, and then they get together at night and make a dinner and drink mm-hmm. some beers and, mm-hmm. and tell some stupid stories um, that they love to tell. For them, that's intimacy. Well, let me, um, I don't know, Patricia, I, I'm hearing you, and I know for them that's intimacy, but is it really intimacy, or is it just people who haven't developed the ability to be intimate, and that's the best they can do? Well, well I suppose you could, I, I, actually, I would say that's the best intimacy that they can do. Yeah. It's, it's their version of intimacy, and, you know, for someone like myself, who um, I would consider myself sort of an intellectual type at times. I'm, I'm an avid reader. I'm constantly in classes and learning and things like that. Part of my thing about intimacy is being able to sit down and have a conversation about some, some concept, some metaphysical principle or some philosophical idea mm-hmm. Or, mm-hmm. or the latest research in quantum physics. And to me, that's intimacy when really? I can have a conversation about that. Wow. And explore it and feel safe enough to talk about that without somebody going, oh, that's stupid. Well, I assume that the flip side of intimacy, if you have enough of it, the flip side of having none of it would be loneliness, the feeling of being alienated. Yes, disconnected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that that activity or just fishing side by side is enough for people to feel connected? not lonely, feeling full up on the need uh, to escape their aloneness. Fill up on the need to be connected with yes. other people. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm kind of disoriented. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I really always thought that friendship has to do with, sh- as you opened, you were talking about sharing your inner self. But if you're talking about theories and quantum physics, is that sharing your inner self? Well, it is if it's something I'm passionate about and uh-huh. it means you know it means a lot to me to learn about it and I don't have a whole lot of people I can talk to about it because yes. they don't understand to have someone that I, that understands you know that means a lot. Well, not to beat a dead horse, let's talk more about men. Okay. When uh, the book I was talking about was A Seasons of a Man's Life by Daniel Levinson, psychologist. It was written uh, in 86, but it continually be, becomes quoted or is quoted and is considered a seminal work. And his conclusion was, in studying men over their entire lives, is four out of five men reported that they have no close friends except their spouse, usually their wife. Mm-hmm. Um, now, What's going on there when he was finding that was not true for women? Well, again, I think it may have to do with the definition of friend and what okay. close friend means. And, and also, I think that for some men, what happens is when they um, get very close to and they're in a significant other spousal relationship and they get really close the trust level that they create is pretty deep, and so they'll share things with that person that sociologically is not the kind of thing that men usually share with each other. Where, hmm. you know, women tend to share emotions, women yes. tend to share their fears, their, you know, all those kinds of things with each other. Mm-hmm. They talk about that a lot. Men, stereotypically, in our society and mm-hmm. in many societies, um, are not taught to do that. Right. They don't have the safety to do that. And so then someone that they actually can talk to those things, talk to about those things, does become their closest friend and possibly their only friend of that kind. Okay, now I'm going to left field, but 
Can they reciprocate? Do they know how to listen to their wives the way the wives listen to them? They have to learn because <laughs> it's not something they they learned uh-huh. growing up. You know, uh-huh. it wasn't part of the guy thing. And and again, I I want to acknowledge that we're talking to a large degree a, a, a generalization yes. and a stereotype. Yes. Um, and it, and it's a very it's still a very valid one in many respects. You know, um, men don't live as long as women. Uh, six years difference or something like that. I think it's coming mm-hmm. down a little from eight. Um, do you think it has anything to do with the lack of intimacy in their lives? I, you know, I don't really feel qualified that I could even speculate on that. I don't know what they consider the different factors to be at this time, and mm-hmm. um, and so I really can't say other than the generality that. Um, we we know that um, the openness of the heart, the, the folks at HeartMath have done a lot of research on heart coherence and, and heart connections between people, and they started their work working with people who were having heart attacks and, and what could they do to help prevent future heart attacks and so on. Um, and from from their work, we know that that, Heart connection is important. So emotional people, connections with others. Yes. Yeah. And and um, it it depends on the person whether or not that emotional need is being met by the kind of relationship mm-hmm. that they have. You know, I I, I can't judge that um, to what degree that would fulfill another person. When when I looked. Um, I did a little bit of, of informal research on what are the kinds of things that people want in friends and relationships. And I found things, people talked about things like loyalty, sensitivity, humor, mm-hmm. honesty, listening, supportive, generous, non judgmental, genuine, mm-hmm. accepting, mm-hmm. trustworthy, respectful, dependable, thoughtful common interests um, and forgiveness and support. Mm -hmm. Those were all things that I found over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at that and I thought, well, what does that mean to me? And then I also thought about what does it mean to me as a woman? And I realized it probably looks different to me as a woman than those things might look to a guy, Mm -hmm. especially a stereotypical guy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And so... Well, I think they want those things, too. I think all people want those things. We look for them to be exhibited differently based on how we're raised in our cultures and both uh, gender as well as um, different uh, ethnic cultures, different countries and and societies. Well, Patricia, I know you give... uh all kinds of workshops that involve thinking about your life and planning aspects of your life. Do you think it makes sense to sit down and assess your friendships and think, do I have enough? Are they deep enough? How do I get more friends? To have a friendship plan? I do. In fact, in the in the successful living basic training, uh, the program, two-day program that we offer at the center, one of the core things that we talk about um, that people need to have is um, four things, health, wealth, love, and creative self-expression. And when we look at love and relationships, what we ask people to consider is what their network looks like. Now, mm-hmm. it's a little risky using that word because it has different meanings to people, but um, what that, you know, what their circle of friends is like. Mm-hmm. And I use the research um, from Robin Dunbar, who um, looked at the optimal number of people in community and in relationships. And he says 150 is the optimal optimal number for a community Mm -hmm. of people. And that once we get beyond 150 people, it's really hard to maintain any kind of connection. And even in, you know, our age of social media, that's true. Once you get 150, 200 friends on Facebook, you can't track them all anymore. I mean, you don't see everything everybody does, and you lose all that in a lot of detail. And what Dunbar's research suggests 
is that what works best, what would be the hypothetical ideal, is five intimate friends, really deep, what you and I have been calling like maybe a best friend kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. And then fifth, those would be the people that you tell anything to, anytime, anywhere, lots of trust. Okay. Then you have, he says, then you have like 15 what he calls close friends. And those are friends that if you're going to have a small dinner party, that's who you would invite over for a dinner and an evening of conversation and that kind of thing. And you would spend time with those people on a fairly regular basis. Um, and then he says 35 frequent friends. And those are the people who maybe you see every couple of months or two or three times a year. Mm -hmm. Those are the people you might invite to your birthday party mm -hmm. or your annual picnic in the yard or, or something of that nature. And then he says, then you have a hundred acquaintances, people that you know, that you've interacted with, they know a little bit about you, you know a little bit about them. If you needed something, you could possibly call on them. You could, you know, do some interaction with them. You might see them every once in a while, but they're not the people that you go out of your way to spend time with. Okay, so if, let's say, you take this assessment, you go, you know what, I only have one intimate friend and six close friends. I better beef up my numbers. How do you go about that? Well, I think it starts with looking at what you as an individual enjoy in life what you're <coughs> excuse me sure mm. okay what you enjoy in life what kinds of things that you're interested in what kinds of things you'd like to do what it is that you value personal values um, like maybe integrity or compassion or you know those kinds of values and look at those things and then ask yourself where do I find people who might be mm -hmm. similar to that and then start going about being involved in organizations or gatherings um, where you might meet people who have those kinds of interests you know interestingly enough one of the things about today's online dating theme thing you know the, the mm -hmm. different organizations that you can go online and fill out profiles um, is that it's a great way to meet a friend. Hmm. Not not necessarily your lifelong companion, but mm -hmm. just to find a friend because they compare all of your interests and backgrounds and things for the things that might be the most um, compatible. Not necessarily the same, yeah. but compatible. But I think of that as a dating <clears throat> place, not a place to find friends. Well, yeah, because that, that's how they advertise it. But I'm saying it's a great place to find a friend. But won't everybody be, get mad at you thinking, I'm looking for a future mate. I'm, why are you wasting my time wanting to be a friend? Well, if you're honest about it up front, okay. you say, I, I'm here because I'm looking for a couple of friends. Yeah. And not ready to get married, don't want to get married right now, just mm -hmm. want to find some friends. Mm -hmm. I would bet that there's other people out there in the same place. Interesting idea. Um, then once you, let's say you say, you know, you sound like a person that, is in my ballpark of interests and values, then what do you do? Have a coffee date, like a regular date? What? Yeah, let's meet for coffee. Let's go out for lunch. Uh huh. You know, and breakfast and lunch are safe bets when yeah. you're thinking about getting so, to know just people. Like dating, you have just to like get online to work dating. And, you know. Yeah. Um, and there's no open evening, you know, what do I do now kind of feeling to it all. Not, um, and just have a conversation and if something about that person seems interesting then simply say you know I'd like to get to know you a little bit more I think it might be interesting to have you as a friend are you open for that and see what happens um, so in a way you're saying that uh, the electronic media uh, so central to our times can be a real help in building friendships I think so if people are wise about how they approach it and are honest and straightforward in their communication. And the other thing I think that people need to remember is that those those five, for for one of a better term right now, let's call them BFF, best friends forever. Mm -hmm. um, th those five really core people. Um, 
our, that develops over time. That's mm-hmm. not something that happens after a coffee or mm-hmm. even a month or two or five. Um, I really think that that's something that can take years to develop. The, the most important thing is that I think everybody needs to have at least one person like that in their lives to start out with. And so if they don't have one, then they need to just be in that process of starting to open themselves up and connect with other people. And, you know, that's kind of scary to folks. Um, Sometimes those closest people can be members of our families if we have, you know, functional family relationships. That could be your sister or your brother or, you know, a cousin or something that you've known for a long time and so there's safety there or a high school buddy or something of that nature. Um, and it, if we don't have that, just know that it's going to take time to develop that. Mm-hmm. I would think for people who are single, this is more critical. It is in the sense that most people who are single may not be living with another person. When you have a roommate or a family, you make connections just by the nature of living in the <laughs> same space. Mm-hmm. And while they may not be as deep, right away they will build over time but a person living alone without um, a a home companion let's call it uh, definitely needs to be reaching out to other folks or can find themselves feeling alone and lonely yes Um, one person I know did just a, a, a wonderful thing and it's really made a huge difference in his life he loves movies and he developed a meetup for movies in his town and uh, he started just opening it up and saying if you like movies I'm going to see this movie Mm -hmm. I invite you to meet me let's go see the movie and talk about it afterwards go out for coffee and talk afterwards was he on some kind of talk group or something to do that or did he Uh, a meetup meetup meetup.com oh okay so there's a whole lot on the internet a lot of people don't know about as a way to facilitate this Oh, yeah, meetup.com is absolutely awesome. You go into Meetup and you can find groups of people who are doing all kinds of different things that might interest you. That you can just go and join the group and attend a meeting or go to a seminar or go to an event or wow. do whatever, you know, and start connecting with people. Well, and he now great. has this, this wonderful group of friends, and some of those people over the years have become very close friends because they discovered other things that they liked about each other. Um, he's single, and he's mm-hmm. happy, and he's healthy, and someday he thinks it might be fun to have a significant other relationship, mm-hmm. and right now, he's pretty happy and satisfied, and from my point of view, when it comes to relationships, it's, you know, being in that place of being the 10 that you want to find mm-hmm. um, is a good place to be, and he's busy building a life that he absolutely loves, full of people, of interactions and people um, and someday the right person is going to come along and they're just boom. <laughs> well, let me, that might be worth the price of admission right there, the meetup.com but is there any other internet ideas you have for people that, besides match.com and stuff like that? Oh, well, meetup and the, some of the, a couple of the dating sites um, are the ones that mm-hmm. um, I would most highly recommend because they're designed specifically for that. Uh, on another level, um, Pinterest and things like that where you're sharing pictures of things that you're interested in, you can go into Pinterest and... Say that again, at, spell that. I don't, never heard of that. P, uh, it's interest with a P at the beginning. Oh, I see. Okay. Pinterest. Dot com. Uh-huh. And you pin a picture to your page, and it, what it's saying is this is... You know, an object that I like, this is an art that I like, this is a photograph Mm -hmm. that inspired me, whatever. And um, other people can see that. If they like it, they can connect. Um, It's a little bit more global than the idea of meetup, which which is Mm -hmm. physically, you know, it can be sorted by locations. Um, So... Those would be that would be another. Well, what site about that, Facebook? What about old acquaintances reviving those? Your high school friends, whatever. Finding you're forty and you go, oh, I remember Sydney from high school, and 
You connect and sure. have some coffee, <clears throat> things like that. Yeah. Facebook is a tool that can be used not for necessarily for finding new people, because mm-hmm. how would you find someone like that? But right. if, you, if you're looking for someone you once knew, if you have yeah. a name, if you have a possible location, you can check out the picture and see if it yeah. matches kind of thing. Right. Facebook can be a great way to connect with people, and I've heard some wonderful stories about people who have connected that way, and I know that I've reconnected with some of my friends mm-hmm. from 20, 30 years ago via Facebook, and it's nice to just have occasional interactions, how are you doing, and maybe an occasional phone call or messaging exchange. Um, it's not quite the same, though, as that in-person sure. connection. But, but it, that it, it would seem to me, Patricia, that you could talk to some people on Facebook who you haven't seen in 20 years and they don't live far away and say, how about getting together? I'd love to see oh, you. Oh, sure. Again. Yeah. Sure, that's a possibility. What about uh, shy people? What about introverts? How do they get along? <laughs> they're a little more challenged because they're reluctant to take a risk to connect. And I actually have another friend who considers herself to be the ultimate shy person. And she actually started, started a website for shy people. Uh-huh. And until it was um, hacked by someone, this was a few years ago before mm-hmm. she people understood how those kinds of things might happen as e- so easily, um, she was connecting with hundreds of people all over who considered themselves to be shy people and Mm. and had like a chat room where they could talk about things because it's not as risky to do that online and because there's the common concern being shy and they can talk about what they run into and give each other tips and suggestions about little things that they've done to help build their confidence so that they can reach out a little. Okay, so a little support. This is not where they're going to make their friends, but it's where they're going to get their emotional tools to go out there. Right. Well, they may they may not make the friends who will end up in that five, fifteen mm-hmm. category, but they will make friends who might end up in that hundred category. These are electronic friends. Mm-hmm. Not someone you'll ever sit down and talk to face to face. Unless they're doing Skype, um, they might see face to face, but not. So you you you, you would allow that those. Uh, Skype friendships might be friendships in the group you listed. You had five intimate, 15 close, 35 frequent, and 100 acquaintances. Would these be the 100 acquaintances? I'm going to guess that Skype people might be in the 35 or the 100 category. Okay, so you don't ever have to actually see them live for them to be part of your friendship network. Well, live as in both bodies in the same physical location, right? Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Because there's so much written about how electronic media has made people lonelier. We're not seeing each other face-to-face. We're communicating electronically, and that's unhealthy. I think a lot of that has happened when it comes to the idea of text and instant messaging and email. Mm -hmm. But the thing about Skype, if you're using video Skype, it's, it's really, it's amazing how much more connected you can feel when you see a person's face and their expressions Mm -hmm. and and can make that connection. It, it's not quite the same as both being in the same place, but it sure is a good second best. What about age? Would you give the same counsel to someone who's 60 as someone who's 23? I would think close to the same. Um, older folks these days may not be as technologically savvy and want to use internet things um, so you know I might move them in a slightly different direction in that regard um, but the same principles hold true mm-hmm. you know you've got to get out and be in the world um, I uh, another friend recently made a decision to move from a condo into um, a senior living community mm-hmm. not a assisted living but yes. a, a senior sure. community yeah. And she said I, she did it because she wanted to be with people who were her age and there were events happening there and oh, yeah. times that people could come together and she could choose which ones she wanted to get to know better and which ones she would just play bingo with. And sure. How old was or, she? 63. 63? Yeah. That's interesting because I, I did a podcast not long ago on running a uh, senior center and the director said the average age of moving is 81, although almost everyone who moves in says we should have done this earlier. Yeah, well, um, I, I 
maybe there's like different levels of communities. And uh-huh. she found a community where maybe retirement community might be a better term. Well, this was one. For yeah. what she moved into the, rather yeah. than senior living. Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. Well, Patricia and Clayson, I want to thank you for sharing all this with us. And I think it's uh, very useful information and ideas. And I hope you'll join us on the next edition of Insights. Mm-hmm.